<laughs> so thanks to everybody for coming. You know, this is a topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart for a variety of reasons, but I think it's important and I think that it's something that oftentimes is not necessarily under recognized, but it's just part of our internal environment that we don't really talk about and sometimes that's to our um, detriment. And so any question that I ask during this presentation should have like an easy answer, like nothing is hard. So you can feel free to shout out some answers. Um, so this is just an illustrative example from my life to give you an idea of some of what my internal environment looks like. So the NIH, who here is familiar with that acronym? Like, yeah, everybody, right? And it stands for the National Institute of? Oh, right. However, at one point I thought that maybe it stood for the National Institute of Homicide. <laughs> and the reason for that is that I got this email, right? And it's like, oh, lecture invitation, you know, and we're existing in the time of, you know, like predatory journals and, you know, all these different emails that you get randomly um, per day. And so I was like, oh, I'm not sure if this is a real thing. Like on the surface level, it looks real, but sometimes some of the fake stuff looks real too. And so I sent an email to Dana, who's sitting in the back, but she's our communications uh, coordinator. So I said, Dana, is there a way um, to check that this is real? I replied to this Jerry person, and you know, he looks legit. He's a director <laughs> of some stuff. He's got some credentials, but I wasn't sure. Um, and then I didn't put all the emails that we subsequently sent. But some of the questions that I asked Dana specifically were, is there a way to check that this is real? How did they find me? Am I part of an academic catfishing scheme that will ultimately lead to being lured to a place where no one can hear me scream? And then finally, jokes on them. I did Taekwondo from kindergarten to second grade and Judo for 10 months of, as an adult and have watched all the Karate Kids. And so ultimately, you know, Dana was like, no, no, it looks pretty real. I've done some research. He's run these courses before. Um, so I said, thanks. I'll reply and say I'd love to come talk slash get murdered. So it ended up being okay. I'm still here. Um, but for me, you know, this, this illustrates the fact that even when we're, for example, a recognized expert in something, we're receiving something that, you know, to the outside would make sense that this sort of email is coming to you, you don't necessarily internalize that sense of accomplishment. And so for today's talk, I'm going to give you a little bit of background, both on myself and why this topic really resonates with me, um, as well as more information about imposter syndrome in general. And then finally, some suggestions. And the suggestions are very much kind of take it or leave it. These are things that may work, may not. Um, but what we'll really try and reinforce today is that with so many things that we try out in our own life, it's important to really try it with a sense of curiosity and not with a lot of judgment towards ourselves. And hopefully that'll make a little bit more sense as we transition to that part of the talk. Um, so for background and why do I care, I'm like, so this is little me, right? Who would have guessed I would have grown up <laughs> to be a doctor? I'm like, oh, look at that little nerd. <laughs> but part of that story includes, you know, where my family and I come from and why I've always kind of internalized being an other, somewhat as part of my core identity. So does anybody have an idea where this picture might have come from? Like name a country. Nepal's close, yeah. Any other guesses? So here's the flag of the country. Does that help anybody? Maybe not. So this is uh, so this is the flag of Mongolia, and that's one of the traditional kind of nomadic tents that's lived there. I put this picture up not because my family or I are from Mongolia, but my family immigrated to the United States when I was young, and my mom is Belgian, and my dad is from Mauritius, which is like this little island um, in the Indian Ocean. And so when we came to the States, my parents said, oh, we're gonna be like Americans and we're only gonna speak English, right? Not realizing, I think, you know, 10, 20 years later, the effect of being linguistically isolated from all of your, you know, non-immediate family. Um, but the other part to that too, is that we always lived in kind of these very rural homogenous um, communities when we first came to the States. And so my siblings and I are all, you know, half, you know, we're multiracial essentially. And so we always looked a little bit different too. And that concept really hit home when I went to visit Mongolia, because if you're aware of the geography, kind of north of Mongolia is Russia, south of it is China. So there's a lot of people that are of mixed Chinese and European origin, which is what my uh, ethnic background is as well. So this was the first place I'd ever been in my life where you're surrounded by people that look just like you. 
And it's kind of that can be kind of jarring if you've always been used to being the other. And one, and it has an impact on the way that people interact with you as well. I remember having to go to the United States Embassy for some paperwork type issues. You know, I go up to the embassy to the little check in booth, put my US passport on the counter, slide it across um, to the uh, security official, and they start speaking to me in Mongolian. And I'm like, no, 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 here's my American pass. You know, I'm American. I don't, I don't speak Mongolian. And they're like, no, but look at you. You're clearly Mongolian, <laughs> right? And so, you know, I think the way that we present ourselves to the world and kind of those past experiences has, has an impact on how we move through things. And so how does that relate to imposter syndrome? I think sometimes imposter syndrome can really be characterized or perhaps better said as other syndrome. And if you have any part of your identity that makes you identify as not being part of the mainstream of whatever group you're belonging to or seeking to belong to, those things can really intensify that feeling of otherness or not belonging. And so these are not all examples from my life, but certainly examples from the people that I routinely interact with. So maybe folks are immigrants, maybe you're a minority, maybe you're female in a male dominated field or a male in a female dominated field. Perhaps you have dissenting political views, depending on where you're geographically um, living. Maybe your sexual orientation is different. Maybe you speak a different language or English is your second language. Or really anything else that sets you apart can play a role in making you feel as if you don't belong. And I think this is one of the reasons why two recent movies like Crazy Rich Asians and also Black Panther really resonated with a lot of people because for a lot of the folks that were watching these movies, it was the first time that they saw casts that were primarily made up of people that resembled them or somehow resonated with their background were represented in that form. And I think professionally that can be important, especially for those of us in academics, because it's often been said that it's hard to be what you can't see, right? So if you don't have anybody to model like, oh, guess what? A minority woman can be X, Y, or Z, you know, or you know, someone who's different for, for any other reason has held these roles or had these titles before, it makes it less of a real thing for you to aspire to and more of just like a concept that sure, maybe it's great for somebody else, but probably not for me. But I think what's equally important too is that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And I hear this a lot at different leadership um, seminars and retreats where we really have to find a way to get ourselves represented even if we don't necessarily feel that we're the most uh, qualified person for it, especially, you know, for the women in the room, there's plenty of social science data that shows that we will apply for positions when we're like 500,000% ready for them, right, by all the criteria. That's a slight exaggeration on my part. Um, whereas, you know, some of our male counterparts might apply for those same things and be successful when they have not achieved 100% of the check marks on that list. And I think one of the correlates to this that can be very important, especially for those of us that are trying to build up our careers as well, is that medicine and life are, are hungry for the things that we have to offer. And sometimes to try and feel like you belong, like you need to, you know, you're qualified for these things, there can be a tendency to really overwork things, you know, almost to really, you know, burn the candle from both ends, so to speak. And one of the things that I like to tell a lot of my students and trainees is that don't put something on the menu if you're not ready to have it ordered. And this can look like all sorts of different things. But if, you know, for example, I had a child while I was a resident, right? Because I did not put on the menu not having children until I was all done with my training. Because if you put it on the menu, if it's something that you offer, it's something that will likely be ordered and, and taken. And so, my next question for you all is, can you guys describe to me what does a, a baby bird or a bird chick look like? This, this is not a trick question. <laughs> Fluffy, yeah. Small, yeah. Cute, yeah. Yellow, you know, so it's typically some of the things we think about. And this question matters because I'm not trying to say, you know, apply for things that you don't feel ready for, or, you know, do things that don't feel genuine for you. But 
to find whatever it is that is authentic for you and to have the confidence to leverage those things for the things that you would like in your career or your life. Because if I just give you a list of prescriptive things to do, you know, it's very obvious if you're one of these baby birds versus the other, you know, if you're the plastic one trying to pretend to be the real one, uh, someone's going to notice probably, right, that you're not being your authentic self. Same as if you're the real one trying to, you know, have some of the qualities of the plastic one, it quickly can become very obvious. And so this leads me into kind of the bulk of the actual imposter syndrome uh, mm -hmm. literature that I'm going to share with you now. So as you read through those statements on the bottom of the screen, reading through them, for how many of you are, do any of these phrases or sentences resonate? Yeah, right. So I can give the impression that I'm more competent than I really am. I'm afraid people important to me may find out that I'm not as capable as they think I am. It's hard for me to accept compliments or praise about my intelligence or accomplishments. These are phrases that are taken from one of the two imposter syndrome um, assessments that are available. Um, and these have been around since the 1970s, but I think imposter syndrome really became popularized uh, much later than that. When I first heard about it, it was actually in the book Lean In, um, where there's a whole uh, chapter and section that's dedicated to it. And, you know, subsequently, as a resident, we did a study looking at imposter syndrome in medical students, which I'll, I'll share with you some of the results. But as we sent out these questionnaires, one of the things that struck me is that while just about everybody raised their hand here who's present for this lecture, there are people that don't have these thoughts. And I, I would say to those of you that are listening, and maybe this, this isn't you, um, it, it's still important to recognize that a lot of the people that you're around do have these thoughts and do have these issues with really internalizing success and achievement. Like I remember one of my uh, faculty attendings came up to me because we sent the same survey out to uh, our faculty. And he's like, Jen, do people really feel this way? And I remember looking at him being like, do people really not? <laughs> is, that, is that an option also? And why it becomes important to have this type of conversation is that for so long, those of us in science and medicine and academia, I think we, we, we feel like we have to present like a really really like put together a cohesive picture of ourselves and like our five and 10 year plan and kind of have it all figured out. Um, but the conversation now is really shifting towards supporting wellness throughout all of those stages, instead of just having, you know, like the Instagram worthy version of yourself on display for people and then not really having those real conversations. And this is reflected, you know, even in the Hippocratic Oath, which for many, many years had not been updated, but it now does also include the phrase, I will attend to my own health, well-being, and abilities in order to provide care of the highest standard. But sometimes I think one of the problems with injecting the sort of narrative into the overall conversation is that people can have dissenting views. So this is a recent publication um, from a medical education journal that was investigating levels of imposterism and, and how that correlated to self-esteem in medical students. And one of the conclusions of the paper was that a good doctor requires high self-esteem and minimal imposter characteristics to have a positive <laughs> impact. And I think this, this type of comment can be you know, very hurtful to folks that don't feel like they belong or are having issues with these imposter type uh, feelings because then it just reinforces the fact that you don't belong. I would argue that having those feelings is normal and all of the literature supports that, this tip, that these types of imposter feelings typically occur in very high achieving people that are driven you know, towards perfection and excellence. And this kind of is just a, a byproduct of that success and drive. And so in the study that we did, we looked specifically at medical students and we were able to get a, a pretty good um, representative sample size between first, second, third, and fourth year students. And so we sent them a survey that had some of the imposter questions that you guys previously saw, and then also some demographic information. And we found that pretty common, you know, so about half of females and a quarter percent of males identified as having very high levels of imposterism. Um, we found that in Asians and whites, that percentage and incidence was about 30%. And to me, the next bullet point there really highlights that it's hard to be what you can't see. 
So for folks that did not fall into the stereotypical like doctor demographic, uh, their rates of imposterism was almost uh, 72 or 73 percent, so three quarters of them. And we also found that there was an increase in the fourth year of medical school. And we thought that this might be because this is when medical students are applying for the match, which is like the, you know, the big process by which you eventually hopefully get into the residency program that you desire. So there's a lot of, you know, like posturing and trying to like, how do I make myself look the best as this candidate? And then there's, of course, all sorts of online message boards of people talking about things that you probably should not read because they'll make you feel very nervous. And we also found, importantly, that high levels of imposter syndrome were also significantly associated with multiple burnout components. And I think this is part of that inner dialogue and inner environment that's really important to recognize, but oftentimes we don't talk about it either. So those that really identified highly with those imposter um, type sentences also experienced more exhaustion cynicism, um, emotional exhaustion, and depersonalization um, than their colleagues. And I think globally, there's a lot of implications as well. So this is, are you guys familiar with this Cheez-It commercial? Okay, I was like, sometimes I don't watch a lot of like recent TV now, so sometimes I wonder if my references age me slightly. Uh, but for those of you that are unaware, basically you're trying to figure out when the cheese is ready to be made into like the Cheez-It cracker, right? So Usually this guy in the picture will come up and ask the cheese a question and the cheese will typically tell some sort of inappropriate joke or make an inappropriate noise. Uh, the reason I put this picture on here is that they've done studies of family medicine residents and they've, they've looked at what their levels of imposterism are and kind of characterize them into high versus low. So you ask all of them, you know, did your residency training program do a good job? And the answer, almost universally is yes, it did a great job training me. I got all the training that I was supposed to get. When you ask those that have high levels of imposterism, okay, cool, so they did a good job training everybody. Did, are you a good physician? Are you a capable physician and ready to be out in independent practice? The higher your imposter score was, the lower you were to rate yourself. Having already said that your program was excellent, you would still say, oh, but for me, I'm still not ready, or I still am not good enough to go out and practice after completing all of this training. And that has implications for career selection, career longevity, and the wellness metrics that we already measured. Because we know that different um, types of people, and these are gonna be kind of some blanket generalizations, but different people respond to those types of thoughts and feelings differently. So women tend to kind of over apply themselves and over compete in those areas to, to ameliorate those perceived deficiencies. Whereas sometimes men will just avoid those areas. And so for women, I, could, I would postulate that perhaps that's one of the reasons why there's you know, more morbidity associated with imposter syndrome for women and the associated burnout um, uh, indices, because you're just trying to overwork yourself to you know, overcome um, these negative thoughts. And so who, who wears a like Fitbit or Garmin something? It measures like your activity and stuff. Okay. And so this is my slide. Cause sometimes people are like, well, when does it get better? Right? So like maybe like you finish your residency or you finish your postdoc, what, what have you, like then are you finally confident enough and you no longer struggle with these things? Um, so this is me, some of my biometric data. And you can see it in kind of in the middle of the screen there, there's 12 PM. So we're like in the, that line is in the 12 to 1 p.m. little window of time. And it's getting towards the end of that 12 o'clock time. So what, what, what do you think might have been occurring? It could have been like at a lecture here, right? <laughs> and I was in fact at a noontime lecture. So do you see how my heart rate at that time is 132 beats per minute? Does anyone want to guess what I was doing? I was not running a marathon at the time. I was not, I was not even presenting, although that's a good guess. I was considering asking a question on a topic in which I am an expert, <laughs> right? But like, still, this is like my body's response, you know, to, to even putting, putting something out there. And so again, I, I just like to illustrate that it's very normal. There are techniques that we'll talk about shortly as to how to try and minimize some of that to varying levels of uh, 
success, obviously. Um, but it's not necessarily something that goes away, but it's something that we can learn to manage better within ourselves. And why it's so important to do that is that sometimes people will try and compensate for imposter syndrome um, by doing some of these things, including um, avoiding failure, oftentimes by kind of failing in advance. So some of this will be, you know, what I think I see most commonly is kind of the self handicapping, the defensive pessimism, and then justify anticipated failures. So what that last one might look like would be like, say I'm really nervous about giving this talk. I come up here to give the talk and I'm like, oh, I just wanted to let you know I was like playing around with my slides earlier. So like if stuff doesn't look right, then that's why. All right, because I'm assuming that you're gonna not like my talk. So I'm giving you a reason already to not like it. I'm giving myself a reason to get poor reviews of the talk, right? That doesn't accomplish anything. And if anything, it, it detracts from the message of what I'm trying to tell you. Um, same thing for defensive pessimism. That's the old like, oh, there's this award that you would like, right? So you're like, oh, I would never get it. And here's the laundry list of reasons why. You don't even try, right? Because you're so, so afraid to fail. And I think something that can be important for us in academia to recognize as well is that there can be ways that we contribute to imposter syndrome, not just in ourselves, but in others. Um, so gatekeeping, this is a relatively new term and, and concept to me, um, but this is essentially the gatekeeper is the person that's putting down or rejecting somebody else's knowledge or experience of something um, to discourage their overall participation. And so that's some, some examples that I've heard um, in my own life have been, you know, you're not, you, you'll never be a good surgeon if you can't handle whatever talks. It's typically like a toxic thing that they're trying to get you to handle, right? Like, oh, you'll never be a good surgeon unless you're willing to work 12,000 hours a day kind of thing, right? Or you'll never be a good, uh, you know, postdoc if you're not willing to stay in the lab, you know, 20 hours a day kind of thing. Or for me, I, I'm an ENT who's subspecialized, right? So I have heard that, well, you're not actually a real surgeon if you subspecialize and give up half of what you decided to train in. Or just simply rolling your eyes when somebody asks a question. These are all ways that we can play a role, whether we know it or not, in letting people know if they belong or should even aspire um, to, what we, to what we do or to what they're trying to do. And I give this talk oftentimes uh, for minority students. And for, for those of us that represent the other, sometimes in today's dialogue, like the other becomes the desirable thing, right? You're like, oh, we need more, you know, people of X heritage or whatever, you know, orientation or viewpoint on our team. And that's why you're selected, right? So like if you're, if you're going to be on a panel for something and you look at your other panelists and you're like, oh, these are all like the stereotypical, you know, older, more distinguished white gentlemen that always populate this panel. And here I am. So I must have been selected because of some of my demographic attributes. Well, I really like this book called The Diversity Bonus. And there's some people from my group that are here. They know that I talk about this book all the time. Um, but this is written by an economist, um, Scott Page, at the University of Michigan. And he makes an argument for the importance of diversity that has nothing to do with equity or you know, any of the ethical considerations of why diversity is important on teams. And his complete, his argument is that for things where you're doing something cognitive, right? So thinking professions, like anything in academics, most things in medicine and science, it's very different than if you're trying to cut down the most trees, you know, per acre of forest. Because if you're just trying to cut down the most trees as possible, you should just select the people that are the best at cutting down the trees, right? The biggest, the strongest, the fastest. But if you're trying to really encourage diversity of thought and have creative ideas and work well as a team and come up with new problems and new solutions, that's where diversity bonuses come into play when you have more diversity on your team. And he shows a lot of compelling data about how it's the diverse teams in these cognitive fields always outperform the ones where you pick the quote unquote best people. And I think that's important to recognize because even if you happen to be the only person of color, the only female or male, you know, depending on what the panel mix is, even if you feel and your brain is telling you that that's why you were selected and it does not have anything to do with your qualifications, that, that doesn't even matter 
because the fact of the matter is that everybody on that team and that team in general will, will rise because of you, regardless of why you were selected. And that's the message that I would encourage you to internalize as opposed to the, the negativity that might be running in your mind. And so now I'm gonna transition into some suggestions. And some of these kind of come from my own life or readings, and some of them also come from podcasts that I like to listen to, because um, there are a lot of great self-help podcasts out there, and sometimes I find that I need a lot of help. Um, and these are, <laughs> these are, some of them are silly, but some of them I think are, are things that we could all tell ourselves a little bit more to help us process and move through the different aspects of our lives a little bit better. And so who here participates in research? Like everybody, right? And then, so who here sometimes has to collaborate with other people? Yeah. So I sent this email to one of my collaborators that I, I already had a great working relationship with her. It was time to put in a grant. And so I sent her this email. So I said, if you're comfortable being listed as a co-I, please send along your bio sketch. If you are not comfortable, please do not hesitate to let me know. Because in the back of my mind, I'm like, I work with her already. Of course, it's going to be great. Uh, I look forward to our continued collaboration either way. Click send, go on my, go on my way. Um, and then I get this response. Do you have a few minutes to talk over the phone about this? We need to chat briefly about the co-I thing. So how does this make you feel? Because that, that's what I felt. <laughs> <laughs> so made, made us feel not great. So then this is the next multiple choice question here. So what do you do next? <laughs> who's, who's, who's panicking? Who's with me and like, oh my god, she thinks the grant is terrible, right? Who's phoning a friend? What do I do? What do I do? Who's just like, forget it, the day's over, I'm just gonna go watch Netflix. And then anybody uh, drinking a lot of wine to mourn the loss of your career before it even began. But typically what does not appear on this list is happily proceed to the meeting. Right? And so the fact of the matter is, I sent an email asking this, this person that I have already collaborated with, I already have a good working relationship with her, asking me if she wants to be listed as a co-op. She sends me an email back saying that she'd like to talk about it over the phone. There are so many things that could be going on in that situation beyond the fact that she thinks that the grant is terrible and doesn't want to be included. Right? Like maybe, the, maybe all her fingers are broken and it's like hard to type. Right? Maybe her computer keyboard is broken and she can't type things. Because um, the reality of the situation was that she was uh, making a career move and didn't know how much she'd be able to participate in the grant. She thought it was great, but she wanted to make sure I was set up with other collaborators who would ensure the success of the project. Right? So like slightly different than what I was initially thinking. So one of the podcasts that I listen to um, a lot talks a lot about a thought model. And the thought model doesn't work for everybody, but I think that for me, it works very well as I try to conceptualize the way that I'm reacting to stuff, especially like when there's a little bit of an inkling in the back of my mind, like this is not the most rational response, like what's going on here? And so it, it, it uh, focuses on the fact that there's circumstances, right? And the circumstances of something are essentially the facts that we could all agree on, right? So in that prior example, the fact is I sent an email and got a response asking for a phone call. Full stop. That's it, right? Because we could all speculate as to the reason why, but what we know is I sent an email, got that response, right? But then it's all my thoughts that triggered like the oh no emoji, which would then cause, you know, binging of Netflix or drinking wine, which then cause the results. And I think it's important because we have an ability to intervene at the thought level. And I think this is where a lot of those imposter types and uh, syndrome thoughts come from as well. Something happens and we immediately think, I'm not good enough, I don't belong, this is not where I'm supposed to be. There's 10,000 more qualified people to be in this spot than where I am. But if we work on what we're thinking and how we're relating to those experiences, that can have big downstream effects, not only for how we feel, but the actions we'd subsequently take and the results that we see manifesting in our own lives. And so this one, <laughs> this one is imposter syndrome, right? Like in a nutshell. I'm sorry for the mean, hurtful, accurate things I've said to you. And so what I do for this one, and this is one of my practical tips, which you can take or leave, 
Um, silly as it sounds, I for a while gave that mean voice in my head a name. All right, so I apologize if anybody here is named Bertha, but that is what I named her. And I just decided, I was like, you know what, we don't have to listen to Bertha when she's being mean to us, right? Just like if you had a friend who every time they called, they just said mean things to you, you would probably stop like accepting the phone call eventually. And we have that same option with ourselves. We can say, this is just the mean voice that just talks nonsense to us and we don't have to listen to her because she's mean and awful and doesn't contribute anything to our lives. And I've also been thinking a lot about what it means to be uncomfortable. And, you know, a lot of times we talk about, you know, being uneasy or awkward, tense, maybe you feel embarrassed or anxious. But I think about it too, in that being uncomfortable is kind of the currency of change and progress in our own lives. Because ultimately we can be uncomfortable because we're stagnant or we can be uncomfortable because we're growing. There's not a lot of just perfect balance in between. And this is where I always think it's very important to kind of approach our lives as an experiment, right? So experiment with naming that mean inner voice and seeing if maybe that makes the message of that voice a little less powerful for you. But just like you would never look at a picture, hopefully you would never look at a picture of my daughter and be like, oh, that's so stupid. Look at how the, the cape Velcroed on. It's not a real superhero cape. The shoes are too big. She's never going to you know, do whatever she aspires to do in that moment. That's not how we treat those things, right? She's trying on some high heel shoes to see if she likes how they make her feel. She's wearing cape for, you know, whatever reason that's important to her. And I would say try on those things, you know, that we talk about here in your own life and see how that works for you. Maybe you don't want to wear the heels or the cape all the time, but you can see if that's an option for you. And so I like this quote a lot, the dream is free but the hustle is sold separately. This is where some of that uncomfortableness has to come in because we have to push ourselves to continually try to grow. And so sometimes I think about this in terms of what are you willing to do, but also what are you willing to feel, right? So let's go back to that example where I was pondering, asking a question and having like some significant tachycardia as a result, right? In that situation, you know, what I, what I was actively thinking to myself was I am feeling this, because there is something that I would like to contribute and I'm okay with feeling this because the contribution is important. For me, this used to manifest a lot in public speaking as well. I used to have like really terrible public speaking anxiety. And one of the reasons was that I knew that I would start getting the tachycardia, which I still get as you all saw, but I also knew like, oh, I would start to, I would really fight that as hard as I could. So then I would start feeling like the flush coming, you know, from, from down here and then coming up the chest, coming up your neck, going into your face. I'm like, everybody's going to see, they're going to see that I'm nervous and I don't know what I'm talking about. And the more I fought it, the worse it got. So I was trying so hard to hide all of that. And then, you know, finally I was working with the coach and, and she was like, well, are any of these things that you're feeling going to kill you? I was like, no, I mean, arguably severe tachycardia could, but probably not. <laughs> but otherwise, right, it's like feeling all flush, is that going to kill you? Feeling your heart racing, is that going to kill you? No. And then she said, well, why are you doing it? I was like, well, because I have something important to say, or these people think that I have something important to say. She's like, well, are you willing to feel those things in order to deliver that message? And if the answer is yes, she's like, then just feel the things and, and do what you need to do. And, you know, the, the rest is just part of it. And for me, that was very helpful because it made it not like a pathology that I was experiencing that disqualified me from doing those things, but just part of the experience, just feel it and move on. And some of that relates to failure. Who likes to fail, right? Like not a lot of hands get raised. Um, but I think that we should set goals to fail sometimes because it makes the things that we want to strive for uh, more possible and ultimately more accessible. And typically I feel that these failure goals um, should be often. And so I think that this guy, Johan, he really provides an excellent example. So he's someone that fails a lot and is not afraid to own some of those failures. So he has a whole CV of failures, which I'm sure most of us have as well that we maintain in some dark recess in the back of our mind. Um, but he put his on paper, right? So he said, this CV is unlikely to be complete. It was written from memory and probably omits a lot of stuff. 
So if it's shorter than yours, it's likely because you have better memory or, and I think this is the key, or because you're better at trying things than me. So we have to be willing to try and fail in order to move forward. And so he puts all sorts of stuff on there. So he's like research funding I did not get. So you see a bunch of those. I'm sure everyone in this room has, has some on that list. But then I also like that he has a meta failure section where he says, this darn CV of failures has received way more attention than my entire body of academic work. But I think it does set an important example, right? That we have to be willing to fail and try new things, right? So maybe you say, my goal this year is I'm gonna unsuccessfully apply for two grants. Because you know what? Now you're at least gonna apply for two grants instead of like putting all of your time and effort into making one absolutely perfect, which no grant ever is, and then maybe not submitting it because you still didn't think that it was good enough. No, we're gonna do our best and we're gonna apply and fail to these two things. We're gonna send in an abstract for this prestigious talk and get it, get it rejected at least twice. Because the flip side is, maybe it gets accepted, maybe you get your funding, you know, maybe, but if you never try because you're afraid to put that line item on your CV of failures, then it's never even an option. And sometimes I like to think about garlic. Who here likes garlic? Most people. Who, are there any brave souls that will own up to not liking garlic? in the room. Yes. So I'm a garlic lover, but I feel for you. <laughs> so I think about garlic in that oftentimes we feel like we need to be liked by everybody. And if we don't think that everybody's going to like us or resonate with our message, we don't even want to get up there and try because we like need to be liked. But sometimes you just got to channel your inner garlic, right? And just be like, look, I'm awesome as garlic, but there are some people who whether you like chop me up, saute me, broil me, they're just not gonna like me. And that's not because I'm doing a bad job being garlic, it's just some people, that's not a flavor that resonates with them. And I think we can benefit sometimes if we take that into our own lives as well. You know, like, of course, if someone is like, I think you're kind of being a jerk and you say offensive things, right? You can't just be like, I'm garlic and this is how I roll. <laughs> but if you're, not, if you're not getting that type of feedback and you, know, you just feel like you're not jiving with someone that you would like to, that's not necessarily reflective that there's something wrong in you, right? It just could be that there's a flavor mismatch that is not going to be reconciled and that does not take away from you at all. So this is from Winnie the Pooh. If you repeat this over and over to yourself, then this would make this some, a positive mantra, right? So you're braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. I do not always have a lot of success with positive mantras. Um, and the reason for that is because Bertha is immediately like, no, you're not. You're in fact not braver than you seem, you're dumber than you, than you think. Right, so because it's, it's like too positive all at once, like I'm not ready to be all of these awesome things right this second. So sometimes I like to think about it in terms of just slowly cranking up the love. So let's pretend that there's some really prestigious award that you want to receive. So rather than starting with like, I'm gonna get this award, right? Because then the negative person in the back of your mind is like, no, you're not, and here's the list why. So sometimes you can start where it's very neutral for you, right? So there is an award. Yeah, it's hard to really argue with that. And then once you're comfortable with that, the next step can be someone will win that award. Because that's also a true statement that's relatively hard to refute. So then maybe someone will win that award and it might as well be me. And then I can win this award. And so for me, sometimes breaking it down into really like safer, more bite-sized progress progressions up to that point of positivity is more helpful than just starting with the over, you know, rah, rah, I'm awesome starting place. I really like the concept sometimes of that solid B minus work because who here likes to strive for the A plus? I know I do, right? So as you're working your way to the A plus and you really want everything to be perfect, what are some things that maybe you start to feel? I start to feel these things, right? You get overwhelmed and what do you typically accomplish when you're overwhelmed? 
zero, yeah, nothing. Um, so sometimes your quest to be perfect actually stops you from getting anything done. And so I like this, uh, I like this quote, each of you is perfect the way you are and you can use a little improvement. I think sometimes when we put our best forth, best, uh, best faith effort forward, um, sometimes that's where we have to live. And so I would say getting solid B minus work done and ready and acceptable for submission sometimes is more important than having, making sure that it is 100% perfect. Because if you're always waiting for 100% perfect, you're, it's, first of all, it never happens. And second of all, it holds you up from actually making progress. Who here has heard um, the term graceful self-promotion? No. So this is another term that is becoming very popular, especially in the leadership um, and professional development kind of realms, right? So it's supposed to be like this magic way that you can talk about how awesome the stuff that you're doing is without like being off-putting to other people. But oftentimes it can be really hard, especially if you have some of these imposter feelings because you don't feel like what you're doing is all that great or that you're necessarily the person to be relaying that information. So you can Google this and there's all sorts of like ways that you're supposed to get better at doing it. So some people will say like, oh, like emphasize the team nature of what you're doing. Um, you know, really give a lot of credit to your colleagues, so on and so forth. And oftentimes that is appropriate, but sometimes you got to be the one that's like up there repping for your research or your team. And it feels like not so graceful. It feels kind of more like this. And so the way that I like to think about it is to say, you know, maybe I can accept that perhaps I'm not the best person to be giving this talk, or I'm not the person that has the most groundbreaking research in this area. Um, but also, I do think that this is content that's important to be out there, right? And in this situation, I am the best person who is here right here at this moment to be a conduit for this information. And for me, it makes it I still don't quite feel like this, but it makes it less of a, like, I'm not the best person, I shouldn't be up here. It's like, no, I'm just the person that's the best to be here right now, giving this talk right now in this moment. Yes. And so I'll end it with that, because I sometimes people like to talk sometimes about their experiences with some of this. I'd be happy also to hear if anyone else has thoughts or how they help themselves kind of work through some of these uh, counterproductive sometimes uh, issues. <laughs>